All right. Good morning, everybody. This is Amy at TAR in Austin. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. All right. Um, we're going to get started now. Uh, this is our next to last commercial webinar of 2016, and it is Service and Emotional Support Animals. I am going to go over some uh, administrative items with you right now. This webinar is about an hour long, and it has been approved for CE credit. In order to receive CE credit, you must be present at a local board office that has uh, monitoring, et cetera. If you have any technical issues with Zoom, I am going to give you a number to call Zoom support. It is, pick up your pencils, 888-799-9666, extension 2. Please do not call us here at TAR or email us here at TAR with technical questions. That is not our area of expertise. Um, everyone who is watching, the webinar will be muted. Um, we have, oh, hello, Lubbock has joined us. Um, we, have a few, we have two local boards who are watching for CE credit. They will have where we can see them, so when they have questions, they can just raise their hand and Charles can speak directly to them, but everybody else who's just watching for information purposes, uh, you are certainly welcome to ask questions. In order to do that, if you move your mouse on your screen, you will see a toolbar at the bottom, and there is a box that says Q&A. If you have any questions, please click, uh, type your questions into the Q&A box, and we will go over them at the end of Charles' presentation. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. The link will be available on the commercial webinars page of the TAR website. By the end of the week, we'll, week, we will post it up to YouTube and you will be able to go back and watch it again. I'm going to introduce Charles. He is Charles Kramer of Hunter and Kramer PC in Plano. He is a member of the Texas Land Title Association, the Texas Association of Realtors, and the Real Estate Probate and Trust Law section of the State Bar of Texas. Charles serves as counsel to the Collin County Association of Realtors and is a member of the Broker Loyal Committee of the Texas Real Estate Commission. Are you still on this year, Charles? Yeah, I just re-upped for another five or six years, so All right. it stuck with we, me. We are grateful to have him presenting this. Thanks so much, Charles. I am going to hand it over to you now. Okay. Uh, one technical question, Amy. I can see San Antonio's room. I cannot see uh, I can't. Lubbock. Is that okay? I'm going to Cade, you'll need to click on the start video. There's a little film camera in the bottom corner of the toolbar, and you'll need to click start video in order for us to see you. Bless you. Got it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Cade, let me see. Can you hear me? I can hear you now, Cade, yes. And now uh, you need to uh, click on the start video button at the bottom of your page. Bless you again. We are all suffering from allergies. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm the class attendee. Cade isn't here. Okay. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, I don't know where the start video button is. Okay, do you have a mouse? Mouse over the screen and you should get a toolbar at the bottom of the screen. And in the bottom left corner, there is a little microphone button and there is a little video camera button. Okay, hold on, I'm, I'm navigating the mouse now. Okay. Yeah. You see I love this. I, this is great because it takes up the time that I need. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do, do you see the toolbar at the bottom of the screen? Okay, hold on. Yeah, once you watch this, just in case it has any value. She's got a real fast mouse. I'll bring some more, and I'll be Got it. Got it. Okay, so you want to click that little video camera that says "Start Video." Start video. Yeah. 
It's on the bottom. There's a little black bar. In the very corner, there's a microphone button. And then next to it says start video. It's a little square. Okay. Click on that to start the video. Do, do you see it? I think I, just a second. Okay, sorry. <laughs> who is this? So I know who I'm talking to. Uh, my name's Barry. Hi, Barry. Hi, Barry. Hang in there. We'll get you going. Uh, okay, it's mute my audio. No, right next to it is a little square thing that says video. You want to click on that that says start video along the very bottom. Toolbar comes up when you move the mouse a little. It's on the should be on the bottom of your screen. Okay. Mute my audio. She wants to start the video. Yeah, you. We need to be able to see you for you to get credit. Okay. Let me. I just got your email. Okay. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're good. You just there's a button that says start video, which you need to click in the toolbar for the app. Should be in the bottom if you move your mouse. And you just need to click on that. Yeah. Ah, okay. Oh, nope. Close. Do you see the toolbar that has the microphone yeah. And video yeah. camera? It's, yeah, okay. it's I'm clicking, it's it's not working. Can you okay, hang on, let me see what I can do. Maybe just start the link up again. No, that's not what I want. Yeah, they just got disconnected. I don't see them anymore. No, they're, they're not disconnected. I just hit the wall. Oh, okay, got it. Hang in there, guys. And now I've lost them. Shoot. Guys, I'm really sorry. Cade, my best advice to you is to sign out and then sign in again with that p panelist. Here we go. Never mind. Don't do that. Go. You're back to a panelist now. All right. Okay. Now you're muted. I don't want you to be muted. Have they confirmed that they have a video camera? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I think we're going to go ahead and start and John is going to take care of Cade offline because we are we're losing daylight here. So Okay. Okay. All right, so go ahead. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. This is kind of uh, alien to me too, so forgive me. Uh, because of my uh, office and the security measures there, I'm doing this from my own study. So you get to see uh, where I study. I don't know, this is where my computer is. So welcome to my home. Uh, my name's Charles Kramer. I will have my contact information at the very end of the, the talk. And if anybody has questions while we're going through this, I highly encourage you to type them in or get them to Amy. And I like to talk to people while I'm talking. I'm not necessarily one of those guys that says, hold all questions to the end. So if, if something I say triggers a question or a comment, let's talk uh, now because you, you may not remember it later. Anyway, this um, idea, this thing started from my reading, uh, believe it or not, several years ago of a New York Times article where a reporter, a very funny lady reporter, decided to test the limits of federal law and she began to uh, bring various animals on onto airplanes such as a python, a llama, an alligator. She brought them into fancy restaurants all in the name of this federal law, which requires accommodation of businesses and landlords. So I, I began to get more interested in the, in the topic and uh, put together this, this little outline. It is not a comprehensive study 
of this law. Um, it is just a, a, a primer, if you will. Um, if you are, if you get into a particular subject, uh, an issue, you're going to have to retain independent counsel. So this is one of my first points in this talk. This little PowerPoint is not legal advice. We're going to kind of go through some principles uh, of the various laws, but it is not, in fact, comprehensive legal advice. Every scenario that you have is unique. Everything depends on the facts and circumstances. So if you do have a service animals legal issue, you're going to have to relate those facts to your attorney. If you encounter a service or assistance animal issue or question, you must seek your own attorney. Do not rely on this PowerPoint outline. This is not going to help you. It will just get you more familiar with, with the, uh, the rules. And the, the second disclaimer I want to make, which I think is the most important thing, is don't shoot the messenger. I am going to relate some interpretations of law, interpretations of statutes from the government. Uh, the way I've chosen to do this is simply, rather than go to the case law where cases are litigated, I've decided to simply, um, let's go straight to the horse's mouth. Let's see what the Department of Justice says on these rules. Let's see what HUD says on these rules. And we will take the source law from them. That's the best way to know what the government is saying about these things. You may disagree with some of these things. You may think that these rules have no limits. They don't, they're not well defined. They're vague um, and they're troubling. And in fact, uh, that is the conclusion that I've kind of reached in many instances. But don't get mad at me. I know this may make some of you angry, but uh, we'll try and get through this uh, with as much factual information as possible. So where did I get the information? I took most of the words that you're going to see on this PowerPoint come from three memos uh, that I have pulled from uh, either HUD or the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice is responsible for enforcing the Americans with Disabilities Act and its codified statutes, and HUD is primarily responsible for enforcing uh, federal fair housing law, the FHA. So we have one joint statement from HUD and the Department of Justice back in 2004 uh, talking about reasonable accommodations under the Fair Housing Act. It also mentions its interplay with the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. I've got another memo, uh, again, straight from HUD uh, from 2011 that came out right after the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, was amended uh, in a huge series of amendments. And then I have a third memo recently from 2013. All of these, if you want to see them, uh, at the end when we get my email address, you can email me and I'll be happy to deliver them to you because most of the source material comes straight from these memos. These are the official proclamations of the federal government and its various agencies as to how this law works. So, you know, we're going to go straight to that to see what we're talking about. This all started with the ADA. I don't recall a lot of discussion of service animals and service dogs and their their effects on real estate in the 80s, in the 70s, or before that. This is a fairly new thing. And so the ADA was a law that was passed in 1990 and subsequently codified into the, into the Code of Federal Regulations to prohibit discrimination and ensure equal opportunity for persons with disabilities in employment, in state and local government services, in public accommodations, in commercial facilities, and transportation. That's where the ADA applies. In 2010, uh, Attorney General Eric Holder uh, of the Department of Justice revised the Americans with Disabilities Act, and it was a big revision. It amended the original 1991 Title II regs and Title III regs, um, and so now when we're looking at the ADA, you're either looking at Title II or Title III. Title II applies to state and local governments and how they are regulated. Title III applies to all of our businesses, what we call public accommodations. They went into effect in March of 2011 and were codified in the Code of Federal Regulations. So Title II, this is the, the part of the law that applies to public entities. Basically, any state or local government any department, agency, special purpose district, or other instrumentality of a state or states, that includes the state of Texas, and oddly enough, any commuter authorities, such as railroads, airlines, they're considered uh, as common carriers, they're considered a public entity. So all, anytime you walk into a government office, 
uh, for services or you're dealing with the government in some other manner, they have to comply with this law. Public accommodations, these are businesses, oh, the way we think of it there. I see Cade, good, excellent. Cade, can you hear me? I can. Excellent, I, I can hear you, okay, great. All right, <clears throat> public accommodations are defined under the, the law, the American with Disability Act, the ADA, is any facility operated by a private entity whose operations affect commerce, that's really broad, and fall within one of these categories. Place of lodging, such as a hotel or motel, and a comment here, which you might take from this, is that it appears that a Airbnb type arrangements and little short-term rentals may have some ADA applicability. We're not gonna get into that today, that's a whole nother talk, but if you do uh, Airbnb or short-term rentals, you need to consider and talk to a lawyer about um, that, that law, basically. Restaurants, bars, places serving food or drink, they have to comply with the ADA. Movie houses, theaters, concert halls, stadiums, or entertainment venues. Auditorium, convention center, lecture hall. So everybody listening to me today is in a public facility or public gathering place for education. You're going to have to have ADA compliant facilities. Bakery, grocery store, clothing store. This is an amazingly comprehensive list if you go through it. Laundromat, dry cleaner, barbershop lawyer, accountant, and here's what's interesting, office, professional office of a healthcare provider, hospital, or other service establishment. So basically all of your healthcare facilities are under the ADA. And, and if you think about bringing dogs into a hospital, there are some issues and, and questions that arise from that. Depot, train station, terminal, uh, airport, museum, library, gallery, park, zoo, you know, you get to you have the right to be accommodated for your disability at, at any of these public places, nursery, elementary school, uh, other place of education, and that's private as well as public. So in a very true sense, your realtor association is also classified as a place of education. Daycare, senior citizen center, homeless shelter, food bank, adoption agency, gymnasium, spa, bowling alley, golf course. That's, a, that's I, I was unable to think of any public business that doesn't fall into one of those 12 categories. So if we're talking about these businesses and these places where the public is allowed to go, let's talk about service animals and where they are allowed. Under the ADA, state and local governments, businesses, and nonprofit organizations that serve the public must generally allow service animals to accompany people with disabilities in all areas of the facility where the public is normally allowed to go. Now let's talk about hospitals. In a hospital, it would be inappropriate, says the ADA, to exclude a service animal from areas such as patient rooms, clinics, cafeterias, or exam rooms. It may be appropriate under the ADA to exclude a service animal from operating rooms or burn units where the animal's presence will compromise the sterility of the environment there. So there is, it isn't a, a no limits sort of regulation. It is clear, however, that places that sell or prepare food must allow service animals under the ADA in all public areas, even if the local health codes or state laws prohibit those animals on the premises. So it is an example of federal law uh, reigning supreme over local law in this instance. Here's something else that the government tells us. Allergies and fear of dogs are not valid reasons for denying access or refusing service to people using these service animals. When someone who is allergic to dog dander and a person who uses a service animal, they have to be together in one of these commercial facilities, for example, in a school classroom or in a homeless shelter, they should both be accommodated. And this word pops up again and again in our talks. Accommodation, accommodation. You have to accommodate people with disabilities. And the way to accommodate someone with a service animal and someone else with an allergy is to assign them to different locations or to separate them geographically. So that is considered a reasonable accommodation that is required under the law. If I suppose if you had a one room facility, uh, then you might not be able to accommodate the service animal. And that's where you get into the weeds. That's where litigation results. When the person that requests a reasonable accommodation and the commercial establishment won't grant it to them, they get a lawyer and they have a court try and interpret where, how far these rules stretch and where do they go. But accommodation is the name of the game. Under the ADA, service animals must be harnessed, 
leashed or tethered unless these devices, they say, interfere with their work or the individual's disability prevents them from using these devices. In that case, you have to use control of the animal through voice signal or other effective controls. I don't know exactly what that means. Again, when you have an untethered animal that's running amok and a service provider or a business decides to kick that animal out, that sometimes results in litigation and you get courts trying to interpret exactly what all of this means here. In both Title II and Title III of the ADA, governments and businesses, the term service animal is defined as a dog. That's the first thing that I want you guys to notice. That was one of the big overhauls of the ADA when um, the Department of Justice amended it in 2010. Service animals defined as any dog that is individually trained. That's the other thing because we're going to contrast that to a definition later in this talk. Individually trained dogs that do work or perform tasks for the benefit of an individual with a disability. That's a physical, sensory, psychiatric, intellectual, or other mental disability. It's not necessarily just a physical disability. But the law specifically excludes other types of animals, whether wild or domestic, trained or untrained. They are not service animals. It is clear now since at least 2010 that only dogs are considered service animals under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And the work or task performed by the service animal, the service dog, must be directly related to your disability. Now here's what service dogs under the ADA can be trained to do. They can assist others who are blind or who have low vision with navigation or other tasks. That's probably the most obvious one, the seeing eye dog. They can alert people who are deaf or hard of hearing to the presence of people or sounds. Someone knocking at the door, your dog alerts you to that. They provide nonviolent protection or rescue work. They can pull a wheelchair. They can assist someone during a seizure. They can alert someone to the presence of allergens. If you think about dogs and their, their sensitivities and their amazing sense of smell, that's a great use of a service dog. They can retreat, and when you think about allergies, some people, uh, it can result in, in death to them. They can retrieve items such as medicine or the telephone. They can provide physical support and assistance with balance and stability to individuals with mobility disabilities. So if you have a hard time standing or standing up, believe it or not, a large animal, a dog, can help you with that. Helping persons with psychiatric and neurological disabilities by preventing or interrupting impulsive or destructive behaviors. We'll get an example of that. But the Department of Justice and Mr. Holder said in these amendments that the crime deterrent effects of that animal and the provision of emotional support, and that is a key phrase, well-being or comfort do not constitute work or tasks for the purposes of this definition. So clearly under the ADA, there is no such thing as an emotional support dog. These dogs have to be, they have to be dogs, they have to be trained, and they have to provide a specific task for a specific disability. What types of service animals do we have? We've got the classic seeing eye dog that serves as a travel tool for people who have visual impairments or are blind. There is a hearing or signal dog. That is a dog that has been trained to alert someone who has hearing loss or is deaf when a sound occurs, such as the classic knock on the door. The psychiatric service dog, some of these concepts were new to me as well. A dog that has been trained to perform tasks or assist people with disabilities to detect the onset of psychiatric episodes and lessen their effects. It might remind the handler to take their medicine, provide safety checks or room searches, turning on lights with people with PTSD, interrupting self-mutilation by persons with dissociative identity disorders, and keeping disoriented people from danger. Disoriented individuals, they just keep them uh, in place until the episode passes. A sensory signal dog, or sometimes called a social signal dog, is a person that is trained to assist a person with autism. The dog alerts the handler to distracting, repetitive movements that are common among those with autism, allowing the person to stop the movement. So an animal, perhaps even better than a human, can help interrupt that cycle. A seizure response dog assists someone with a seizure disorder. How they do it depends on the person's needs. The dog may simply stand guard over the person during a seizure, or the dog, if they're in a, a dangerous situation, the individual, they may go get help and bring someone back. A few dogs have learned to predict a seizure and warn the person in advance to sit down or move to a safe place. I, I find this fascinating, and if you're interested in this, learn more and study more about autism 
because there is definitely uh, a skill set and powers that dogs have that people don't in terms of perception. They seem keenly attuned to people with autism. It's like they're on the same wavelength and they can sense things. Now, <laughs> in the original version of this, I just had this slide because I was doing the research and believe it or not, there is law that allows for people to use miniature horses for their disabilities. But I decided to give you a little more today. So um, what is exactly that law? They, in 2011, they, they revised the ADA regulations to allow miniature horses that have been individually trained to work or perform tasks for people with disabilities. Yes, I'm having a hard time believing this too. I don't know how this got passed. I guess the miniature horse lobby felt that it was very important to people, but I perhaps don't have an appreciation for what exactly these horses do. Miniature horses are defined by these laws as ranging in height from 24 to 34 inches and weighing between 70 and 100 pounds. So they are fairly small animals, like a very large dog perhaps. Entities covered by the ADA must, again, reasonably accommodate. Now, again, you've got these guidelines, and if you look at them, you will see that it's not carte blanche with a miniature horse. You have to assess whether the miniature horse is housebroken, whether it's controlled by the owner and how well it's controlled, whether the facility can accommodate the miniature horse's size, type, and weight, and whether the presence will not compromise legitimate safety requirements necessary for a safe operation facility. So, the Department of Justice is not telling all, land, all uh, business owners that you have to permit a, a miniature horse wherever, but there may be instances where they are allowed to go when you go through this analysis. So that's the ADA, and you may feel comfortable that that law kind of stops at dogs and requires training, but there's another very important law that you guys need to be aware of, the Fair Housing Act. And as you can see, this law goes way back. It's a very old federal law going back to 1968. In 1968, we weren't really talking about service animals, service dogs or anything like that. So it is really the ADA, which came along in 1990, which brought this question and this issue to light. The Fair Housing Act makes it clear that you may not discriminate in the sale or rental or, or otherwise make unavailable or deny a dwelling to any buyer or renter because of their handicap. And not only their handicap, but the handicap of someone that is not necessarily the renter, but someone that's intending to reside there with that person. And then you've got this third clause in the law that says any person associated with that renter or buyer. I was trying to wrap my hands around that uh, earlier. You know, I suppose that means that if you have a disability, Let's say you don't have a disability, but your mother does, or your brother does, or a close family member. It is illegal for the landlord to say, your mother can never come visit you with their service dog because we don't allow dogs in our houses here. So that is the associated with. I, I haven't seen a lot of case law, and I haven't seen a lot of discussion with that, but I find that particularly fascinating. It shows the breadth and the strength of this law. It is very, very broad. Now, what is discrimination defined as? It includes a refusal to permit at the, ex look at this, at the expense of the handicapped person. So you're not requiring necessarily the landlord to modify things, but you have to allow the, the person with the disability to make reasonable modifications of the existing premise. I don't know, build a wheelchair ramp, for example, at their expense. The Department of Justice, and, and really HUD, HUD is the one that enforces this particular law, says in the case of a rental, a landlord, where it is reasonable to do so, may condition that permission on the tenant agreeing to restore the interior of the premises, so maybe an outside wheelchair ramp might not qualify, to the condition that existed before the modification, reasonable wear and tear accepted. So you needed to blow apart the walls, and the tenant is willing to do it, the landlord can, uh, with the assistance of an attorney perhaps, get that lease in uh, a format that requires the tenant to put those uh, walls back where they were in the first place, to remodify to its original configuration. Discrimination under the Fair Housing Act also includes a refusal to make reasonable accommodations and rules, practices, or services where they may be necessary to afford such person an opportunity to use the dwelling. Think no pets, no pet requirements, no, regu no pet regulations. Uh, you can't do that under the Fair Housing Act. So 
instantly we are coming across a distinction between the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Fair Housing Law. The Department of Justice has defined a service animal under the ADA as dogs and only dogs that are trained to do specific work. And it specifically and expressly excludes emotional support animals. Under the Fair Housing Act, HUD says, you know what? We don't have any definition of a service animal. It can be any animal, um, including animals that provide emotional support. So there's the big distinction. The federal fair housing law expressly allows emotional support animals and the ADA does not. And here's the big kicker. No specific training seems to be required under the federal fair housing act. So you just have an animal who says it provides emotional support. We're going to talk about how you document that. <clears throat> We go straight to the horse's mouth uh, to look at where we get this, this information. Neither the Fair Housing Act nor HUD's implementing regulations contain a specific definition of the term service animal. Again, this is fair housing. Species other than dogs with or without training and animals that provide emotional support have been recognized as necessary assistance animals that require reasonable accommodation by landlords and sellers. The government goes on to say, the new ADA re regulations, you gotta recognize this is that 2011 memo that came out right after the Department of Justice modified the ADA, does not change the federal housing, the Fair Housing Act analysis, and specifically notes that a person with a disability has the right to have an animal other than a dog in their home if that animal qualifies as a reasonable accommodation and is necessary to give them equal opportunity to use and enjoy the dwelling assuming that the animal does not pose a direct threat. We'll get into some of those definitions. In addition, emotional support animals, the government says, time and time again are expressly allowed under the Fair Housing Act, even though they're not allowed under the ADA. So you see a, a, a different treatment of, say, a business from a, a private landlord. You've got to comply with the Fair Housing Act if you are, in fact, a landlord. A housing provider must reasonably accommodate a request for an assistance animal regardless of pet restrictions or no pet rules or requirements. So landlords, you can have your no pet rules, but if someone with a disability comes in and says, I need this assistance animal, I need this assistance python for my well-being, for my emotional support, you're going to have to consider it. You can't just reject it outright. Further definition, again, you can read this uh, in your materials if you have these materials, but this is, again, further confirmation. HUD has said three times now, it's not just animals that are trained to do physical tasks, but they also can provide emotional support. So you can have an emotional support animal that doesn't do anything, is not trained, is not trained to do any specific tasks to help the disability, but does provide emotional support. That is expressly permitted under the federal fair housing law. So if you are a landlord and you get a request to accommodate or allow an assistance animal, you got to ask yourself two questions. Does the person seeking to use and live here have a disability? And that is defined as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one of their life activities. And two, does the person making the request have a disability related need for the assistance animal? What is, what is the connection? In the case of a seeing eye dog, it's obvious. But if a person comes to you with uh, a vision impairment and uh, they've got a little turtle in their hand, you might ask, okay, I, I understand and I see the disability you have. What is the connection of the turtle? How does the llama work into it? Whatever. You, you ask the question for the connection of the animal to the disability. If the answer to both of these questions is yes, then you as the landlord must accommodate them. You must permit that person with that disability to live with and use an assistance animal in all areas of the premises where persons are normally allowed to go. Sounds very similar to the ADA, <clears throat> unless doing so is not reasonable. So we get into this whole question of what is a reasonable accommodation, what is an unreasonable accommodation? The Department of Justice in its various memos and, and pronouncements of this law has said you, it is not considered reasonable if making the accommodation constitutes an undue financial and administrative burden, that's one example, or would fundamentally alter the nature of the landlord's services. 
The determination of whether something is an undue financial administrative burden must be made on a case-by-case -case basis. And here's what the government looks at. They look at the cost of the requested accommodation, the financial resources of the provider. So a landlord that, that has limited means and has one rent house is probably going to be treated differently by the feds than a professional landlord with hundreds or thousands of, of rental units. They have more uh, capital and more financial abilities. The benefit that the accommodation would provide to the requester, so high cost and very little benefit, weighs into this analysis. And the availability of alternative accommodations that would effectively meet their disability related needs. That last one is the key to kind of understanding this law. When you get into a difficult request, a request to accommodate, and you don't feel you can do it because of the cost or the nature of the thing, what what the federal government wants you to do is sit down with the requesting party, your potential tenant, and think, well, what else can we do besides this that might meet your needs? To brainstorm. <clears throat> Again, more emphasis. Is there an alternative accommodation that would effectively address your disability-related needs without, in, without a fundamental opera, uh, alteration of my operations or without imposing an undue financial burden? If there is, you got to give it to them. What is a fundamental alteration? It is a modification that alters the essential nature of a provider's operation. Here's a classic example. Someone has, they're a tenant at your uh, apartment complex. They have a difficulty walking. They have a mobility impairment. They ask the landlord, would you drive me to the grocery store because of my disability and assist me with shopping as a reasonable accommodation under the federal fair housing law? The landlord goes, well, we don't, provide transportation facilities to any tenant, and we don't help any tenant shop, so granting that is a fundamental alteration in the nature of our operations. What we do is provide housing, and we keep that, and we maintain that housing. That's all we do. So the, the uh, HUD says you can deny that request, but you've got to consider an alternative accommodation. For example, why don't we grant you a special parking space near your apartment to allow a volunteer from a local community service organization to park right next to your unit to bring you out to the car and to take you shopping. That is an accommodation that I can do as a landlord and the feds would be very pleased with that. That's an example of, of trying to figure out a solution to accommodate them. If you simply say, no, I can't take you shopping, you have a basis for a, a fair housing complaint because you haven't thought it through. Courts have ruled that the act, this is the Fair Housing Act, may require a landlord to grant a reasonable accommodation that involves costs. So again, it may cost you something, but as long as it isn't an undue financial burden on you or doesn't change the nature of your operations too fundamentally. Housing providers may not require persons with disabilities, here's the key thing, to pay extra fees or deposits as a condition of receiving a reasonable accommodation. This is where the pet deposit issue comes into play. Basically, what the law says is that if you have a service animal, you may not, as a landlord, require a, a special pet deposit. <clears throat> so the question arises that I was thinking about, okay, could you just simply increase all your security deposits across the board. I think the, the feds would say, as long as you are not discriminating against people with disabilities, as long as you're making every tenant pay the same thing, then you could, if you wanted, if you were concerned about the cost of service animals and the damage to your, your uh, rental unit, you could increase the, the security deposit for everyone, but you gotta treat everybody the same. Now, <clears throat> HUD says that you can still require a tenant to cover the cost of repairs for damage that the animal causes to your unit that is beyond reasonable wear and tear if it is your practice to do so. I don't know any landlord that says, no, I'll eat any damage to my unit. So while you can't charge a pet deposit, you can charge an ordinary security deposit. And if the, and if the animal truly damages the place beyond reasonable wear and tear, you're allowed to make the tenant pay for that. And if they refuse to pay, I suppose that's basically a lawsuit for damage. You're not treating the, the disabled tenant any differently than any other tenant. So you don't have to, to eat that cost as a landlord. <clears throat> you can also deny a request for accommodation for a service animal if that animal poses a direct threat to the health and safety of others that cannot be, again, reduced or eliminated by another reasonable accommodation 
or that particular service animal would cause substantial physical damage to the property of others. Why can't I have my service, my emotional support elephant in my one bedroom efficiency? Well, that's gonna tear the place up. We can't do that. We gotta, we gotta find another animal for you perhaps. Can you find something else? Why can't I bring my, my Bengal tiger into the, well, again, that's a safety issue. That's not reasonable. We, we can accommodate you in other ways if you had a dog or something else. Now, <clears throat> at the same time, the, the, the uh, HUD says you cannot take into consideration breed size and weight of these animals. Now I gave some extreme crazy examples so if you did have an elephant or a tiger I have a feeling that 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 will weigh into the analysis but this is really about pit bulls, German shepherds, Dobermans. There are some landlords and people out there that have fears of certain animals uh, because of their breed, because of the nature of the animal and so what what the government says is you are not allowed to reject the request for a service animal simply based on your guess that that particular breed is dangerous, your fear about that. You have to have an individualized assessment of that particular animal's conduct. So if a, if a tenant wants to come in and bring their, their Rottweiler in, and that Rottweiler has been seized by the, the city or the county three times for biting other people, you got a specific track record for that animal. That landlord has much more uh, weaponry and ammunition to say, you know, no, th this particular dog is a bad dog. I'm sorry, I can't let that in the house. But if a guy says, look, I wanna bring my, my python, my 25 foot long Burmese Python, it provides emotional support, I have a letter. I'm using extreme outrageous examples, but this is the analysis we go through. And the landlord says, ah, I don't think that's a good idea. They may wanna get with their lawyer because the lawyer will look at the law and say, well, what do we have on that particular Python's actual conduct? What has happened in the past? And that's gonna be a tough one. So when we get into the fair housing law, there are certain questions that you can ask of people with disabilities and there are certain questions you cannot ask. You may not ask a tenant or applicant to provide documentation showing their disability or their need for an assistance animal if their disability or their need is readily apparent or already known. For example, someone who's blind or has low vision, you can't ask them, well, why do you need a dog? They're blind, it's obvious. Federal law actually prohibits the question. You may ask someone who has a disability that is not readily apparent or known to you to submit one, reliable documentation of your disability, and we'll talk about what that reliable documentation is, and your need for the assistance animal. What is the connection to the assistance animal? However, if the disability is known, but the need for accommodation is not, you can only ask the question, what is the disability-related need for the accommodation? So, for example, uh, you know, okay, I see you're, you're, that you are blind. Uh, I'm not asking you that question. So uh, what, how does the turtle work into it? How does the, you know, how does whatever? I don't, I don't understand the need for that particular animal. Can you provide me documentation of how your turtle helps your disability? Charles? Yes. Do you mind us popping up with a question or two? I would love a question. All right, well, a little bit, well, somebody asked how you house train a horse. I presume the answer to that is with a shovel. Yeah, um. <laughs> I, I don't know. You know, I, I, I was hesitant to go into the miniature horse thing, but I use it as an example to show how amazingly uh, uh, crazy some parts of this law are. I have not ever seen an example of miniature horses being used, but there, there must be somebody out there that needs them. And so I, I have a poor appreciation for the need <laughs> but I, the fact that the law discusses whether a miniature horse is house trained or not indicates that perhaps you can house train a miniature horse like a dog. That's right. that's the extent of my knowledge on that. A, a further question, and this touches back to someplace you, a little earlier. It says you mentioned crime prevention and comfort is not a reason as a service dog. So there is no ADA protection for comfort animal, no accommodation. Correct, correct. I wanna make that absolutely clear. We have two big, big federal laws and they have very contrasting requirements. ADA is strictly, confined, uh, strictly described and strictly limited. Must be a dog, must be trained, cannot provide emotional support. It's gotta be trained to, to do a task to assist a disability. But HUD 
goes completely the other way and says it can be any animal, it can be untrained, and it can be one that solely is there to provide emotional support, doesn't do any particular task or uh, help you with your disability other than being there. So it's a very loosey-goosey definition. Okay. Now, and I have one more question here that um, you may be answering this later. If so, we can hold off. It says, uh, can a landlord deny an applicant with a dangerous breed dog if their homeowner's insurance would raise significantly or cease if a dangerous dog were living on the premises? That, that uh, not automatically, says the government. That relates to cost. And so we go back to that analysis and discussion. Is it an undue or, or overly high financial burden? Okay, uh, if it's going to raise it to a point where you can document to the government, I simply can't afford the insurance, then, you know, we have to talk about what reasonable accommodation can we make? Is there another insurer that will take it? Can we do it in some other manner? Sometimes there is no good answer and you got to get a lawyer to deal with these issues. But what I want to emphasize is that um, when you get a request for an accommodation, uh, you have to take it very seriously. You have to be very delicate and tiptoe around these issues. And you're going to have to ask yourself deeper questions. What do you mean it's going to cost more? How much more? And is that, is that well, you know, you make $2 million a year, so I don't know why you're griping about an extra $10,000 a year premium. That's, that's going to be the government's uh, particular analysis. They're going to relate it to what can you afford versus the cost of that thing. It'll go into a financial analysis. All right, and, and one last question that we have right now. Okay. Is there a number limit on how many service or comfort animals per tenant? Not under the law. If, if you need more than one and you can document your need, you know, if, if a doctor or a healthcare provider or somebody similar says you need three of these, uh, then, then the need is justified. I haven't ever seen that in real life, but I will tell you the law does not put a limit on the number of, of service animals, assistance animals we call them, on a particular case-by-case uh, -case basis. <clears throat> and then, uh, sort of, sorry, one more thing, sorry. Sure. Uh, we'll follow up to the insurance question. Uh, it says, most insurance companies will not cover certain breeds of dogs. Does that mean there's no feasible accommodation? What, what do you do if you can't find a policy that will cover a specific breed? You might, with the advice of your particular counsel, deny the, uh, deny the request and say, we're going to have to find some other animal that, that I can get uh, with my insurance because I can't lose my insurance. Maybe, uh, you know, but again, some of these things don't have great answers. So I, I'm convinced that everybody in the audience can dream up a scenario to stump me. It's possible. So the goal of this is to kind of give you the broad line, broad line brush strokes to kind of give you an idea of what the rules are. Your particular facts may vary. Uh, my guess is if you get into a situation where you can't get insurance, you're going to have to get a lawyer and you're going to have to figure out a, an accommodation that the tenant can live with. I don't, I'm not going to tell everybody they have to rent to a tenant without insurance, but I'm also, I'm very leery and cautious of telling people, uh, just say no. Don't worry about it. There, there, is, there is very often, but not always, some solution to the problem. I just don't know what it is right here. I'm sorry if that's not a great answer. All right, so someone who has an obvious mobility impairment, uses a walker to move around, ask your landlord to give you a parking space near the entrance to the building instead of a space far away. Yes, <clears throat> you, since you can see what the disability is and the request and the need for it is readily apparent, you basically can't ask questions about that. You just give them the space here. A rental applicant who uses a wheelchair advises a landlord that you wish to keep an assistance dog in your unit even though you have a no pets policy. Your disability is readily apparent, so you can't ask about, you know, why do you need a wheelchair, but you can say, how does the dog assist you with your disability? You can even ask them to provide reliable or documentation or information about the disability-related need for the dog. Someone with an obvious vision impairment requests that the leasing agent provide assistance to me in filling out the rental application. You, oh, well, I skipped past that, but sorry. The housing provider may not require the applicant to document the existence of a vision impairment. So it, it's kind of a common sense rule. If you can see what the uh, disability is, you can't ask about it. 
If you can't see what it is, then you can ask them to provide documentation. And if you can't see the connection between the animal and the disability, you can ask them to provide documentation. A landlord may ask persons seeking a reasonable accommodation for an assistance animal that provides emotional support to provide documentation from a physician, psychiatrist, this is straight out of the words of the government, social worker, or other mental health professional that the animal provides emotional support that alleviates one or more of the identified system or effects of a disability. That documentation is sufficient if it establishes that the individual has a disability and that the animal in question will provide some sort of disability related assistance or emotional support. Kind of a big definition or broad, but that's what the feds have said officially is the word on emotional support animals. So it isn't just a doctor. You can get a letter from uh, a therapist, for example. Um, if the disability is not obvious, what kind of information may you request from the person with a disability in support of it? <clears throat> you can't normally inquire into the nature and severity of their disability, but you can ask, do you have, if you can't see the disability, do you have uh, something that meets the definition of the law of disability, the Fair Housing Act? Do you have a physical or mental impairment? Give me documentation. And then again, what is the accommodation that you need and how does the request for the animal fit into the accommodation? You can ask those questions. But you can, you can the threshold is very shallow. So when you're asking about disability, if, for example, they provide you evidence that they're getting SSDI benefits or Social Security income from, from supplemental Social Security uh, for disability, you're supposed to stop there. You're supposed to take that at face value and say, okay, you have a disability. A doctor or other medical professional, a peer support group, a non-medical service agency, or get this, this is what the government says, a reliable third party who is in a position to know. I don't know what that means. About the individual's disability may also provide verification of the disability. So folks, don't think I gotta have medical records, I gotta have a doctor's letter. It can be other, there can be other evidence. In most cases, an individual's medical records or detailed information, this is straight from the memos and straight from the government's mouth, about the nature of a person's disability is not necessary for this, in, this inquiry. So if you start getting too pushy, you start doubting them and saying, I want to see your medical records, the feds will come in and say, you're not allowed to ask that. That's violating the law. Once you provide that they have met the definition of a disability, you should only ask for documentation that is reasonably necessary to evaluate the request. You can't go too deep. A housing provider, again, stated in 2013, may not ask an applicant or tenant to provide access to medical records or medical providers or provide detailed or extensive information or documentation of their physical or mental impairments. It is a very superficial surface inquiry. So <clears throat> let's talk about the unanswered questions. Training of service dogs and assistance animals. What is required? Well, we kind of got the answer to that really. Uh, nothing. There appears to be no express training requirements under the Fair Housing Act for any assistance animals. Under the ADA, yes, they got to be trained. But under the Fair Housing Act, no, no training is required. They have said that time and time again. Are service animals and assistance animals, this is under the Fair Housing Act or under the ADA, required under federal law to be identified with a special vest? ID card or collar. You know, they often are, but does the law require it? The answer is no. Incredibly, neither the ADA nor the Fair Housing Act requires any labeling of these assistance animals. If you tell your landlord or your, your accommodator, uh, the government example, uh, or a business that they are a service animal, but they don't have a special vest, that's fine. You're, you can't deny them the accommodation because they're not wearing a vest or a tag or a collar. What about bogus service animals? This is, this is the problem with this law. This is the problem with the, the agency's interpretation of the law. It is fairly easy, and if you want a copy of that New York Times article, you can email me and I'll send it to you. It's quite amusing. Uh, that if you go online, you can consult a mental health professional 
And what this reporter did basically was scan the system and said, yes, I've got this uh, emotional issue. And the doctor asked him to fill out a questionnaire and of course pay money. It costs between two and 400 bucks. They got a letter at the end of the day and they used the letter and their llama or the letter and their giant 300 pound pig to go test the limits of this law. So the, the federal government does not require detailed medical evaluations, does not require, uh, does not permit you to go into detail on the, on the medical history of the person with a disability. So um, the system is, is ripe for abuse. There is at least some sort of law in the state of Texas that deals with it. I will tell you it's not very strong, but the Texas Health and Safety Code and Texas Human Resources Code were amended back in 2013 to provide a misdemeanor for people who fake this stuff. So someone who uses an animal to represent that they have a specially trained service animal when in fact that no training has in fact been provided. So you can go online and you find these service collars or these service animal vests and you put them on your dog so that you can go take your dog into a restaurant or take them into an apartment with a no pets policy. Uh, if they establish that you have lied and committed a fraud, it's a misdemeanor and it can be prosecuted. You pay a fine of up to 300 bucks and you get 30 hours of community service to be performed for a governmental entity or nonprofit that primarily serves persons with visual impairments or anybody else the judge wants to do. So I, I kind of look at it as a slap on the wrist. I think we need to beef up these laws. I don't know of any federal law that punishes people who misuse the system. So we have a real absence of, of penalty provisions in the federal law. We have at least a, um, a little bitty state law. Amy, are there more questions that have popped up? Yes. <laughs> okay. With my mouth. Um, uh, there are a couple of questions and a couple of comments. Okay. Somebody says that they have had their tenants provide their own insurance po policy to cover liability when homeowner's insurance presents a gap. Um, I suppose I, that I would be concerned that 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 could be a claim for a basis for discrimination. You don't require non-disabled tenants to provide their own insurance, so I worry about that. But again, that's getting into the weeds. It's very it's it's a very tough issue. If if that if that solves the particular problem for that individual, great. But I want to warn people to be cautious because uh, HUD which regulates these complaints against discrimination of people with disabilities will look at anything that they will basically say, are you imposing a penalty or cost on somebody that would not be imposed on someone without that disability? And if they are, you risk losing the analysis. Again, it is a balancing thing. It is a reasonable accommodation thing. The government might side with you and say, okay, what, what have you done to reasonably accommodate them other than provide the insurance? We well, are allowing the animal. Okay. We'll, we'll say that's a fair sort of thing. So be very careful. All right. I have another question here that says, is there a circumstance where a landlord is required to waive a standard pet deposit for a disabled tenant and their service animal? Is there a circumstance? Yes, all the time. I, 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 maybe I haven't made that clear, but if you have a person that has a disability and they have requested that their animal live with them, you cannot says the government, impose a pet deposit on them. Even if you do that for other people, you can't, you simply cannot impose a pet deposit or a, or a fee for that animal. You have to waive it for them. And that's where landlords get angry because they're worried that this is bogus. This is fake. You know, I got someone, I don't know if they got, if this is a real service animal, they're trying to get out of paying my thousand dollar pet deposit. Well, you know, that's why the suggestion was made. Maybe you want to consider raising your security deposits on all your tenants. So it's in a non-discriminatory manner. That's one solution. And I gave you a, a little bit of uh, word of the government that says you can still go after the tenants for the damages their animal causes beyond reasonable wear and tear, but you just can't impose a security deposit. They view that as a penalty. Okay. So, um, to sort of recap, a landlord can't refuse to allow the tenant to make the accommodations, but 
You can require your tenant to return its property to the original state when they leave. That is correct. And uh, that is according to the ADA. Yes? Yes, we're talking about ADA there. Okay. There, fair housing, <clears throat> the ADA has a lot more to do with architecture and architectural barriers. That's really the law that talks about accommodating someone with a disability. Uh, and so we kind of left a little bit just to have a better understanding and a better feel for what reasonable accommodation is. We, we left the topic of animals for just a little bit. So if someone says, look, um, I, need a, I need your door jams widened in your apartment uh, to accommodate my motorized wheelchair, the landlord is allowed to say, fine, you do it, and then you put it back the way it was before. That's The ADA is a lot stricter than the federal fair housing law. <clears throat> but on the other hand, if you're a landlord and a tenant says, I want to bring uh, this really big 150-pound Great Dane in there as my assistance animal, the landlord can't say no if it is, in fact, documented that that is necessary for their disability. They can't impose a pet deposit but they can go after them for the damage beyond reasonable wear and tear, and they can use their regular security deposit, the same one they charge everyone else, for the damage. So there's a little bit of a balance in there. Okay, so you can, you can charge a regular security deposit, but not specifically a pet deposit. Correct. Okay. Because a pet deposit basically applies to only people with pets. It is considered by the government to discriminate against those who need assistance animals. Okay. Um, so here's a sweeping generalization. Tell me if this is correct. Yeah. Private landlords have to pay attention to the Fair Housing Act and ADA, yes. where a business owner is more controlled solely by the ADA, correct? Correct. I would say that, and there is some overlap in these laws, the one that private landlords really have to focus on is fair housing. Um, the ADA is really more focused on, there is some overlap. I, I don't think you have to comply with ADA barriers if you're not doing public house, if you're not doing public housing. So if you're, if you got a boarding house or someplace where multiple unrelated people live, then that is both a business and a, and a dwelling. And so you have the Fair Housing Act and you have the ADA. But if you have a single family residence, that you're renting out to an ordinary tenant, you don't have to worry about the ADA that much. That is not considered a public place. That is still a private property, and you're entering into a contract. The ADA has less or little applicability as far as architectural barriers. Uh, it's the Fair Housing Act that private landlords have to really focus on with its very broad rules concerning assistance animals. Great. All right, someone's asking if we can get a copy of the slide presentation. Yes, we will. Yes, of course. Thanks for you. Um, does anybody else have any questions? We have time for a couple more if you want to type them into the Q&A box. I've got uh, Ms. Moss in here. Kinski, do you feel like you've got everything answered? I believe so. You're so uh, thorough, Charles. Again, I know you've mentioned this at least 10 times. <laughs> <laughs> but will you, again, uh, address whether the ADA recognizes emotional support? <laughs> yes, I will. The ADA does not recognize emotional support animals. The Fair Housing Act does. So ADA strictly defined, dogs only, must be trained, and the Fair Housing Act can be any animal does not need to be trained, and does include emotional support animals that don't particularly do any tasks. So it's a much broader, uh, more encompassing, inclusive, vague, if you will, uh, rule. That's what I want everyone to take away from this. Okay. Um, last call for questions, everybody. Uh, somebody says, very useful, thank you, and I concur. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, as you guys can see, Charles's email address and phone number uh, is uh, there on your slide. You can also email me if you have questions. I am a gamber, a g a m b e r, at texasrealtors.com. Uh, if you have any questions, we will uh, post this recording by the end of the week. So we will wrap up now. 
Charles, thank you so much. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Kenzie. Sure. I really enjoyed it. And uh, you guys call me or email me if you have further questions, okay? okay. All right, so I'm going to mute Charles while we uh, wrap this up. And um, whoop, there we go. Uh, we will remind all of you that, yes, we have recorded this. We will post it on our YouTube channel. The link will be on the commercial webinar page by the end of the week. Uh, our next webinar is November 15th at 10 a.m. Uh, the subject will be an introduction to LEED certification. It will be taught by Patricia Rayburn of Valterra Realty in Austin, and CE credit for this is pending. There will be a registration link on the commercial webinar page soon. It's not there yet, but it will be there soon. Um, if you would like to attend the LEAD webinar for CE, please contact your local association. Again, if you would like to receive CE credit for any of these webinars, you must contact your local association ahead of time so they can get a setup. Um, if you have any other questions about that, again, please feel free to email me or call me here at TAR. Uh, I think that concludes everything else. And with that, we will sign off. Everybody have a great day, and we will see you next month. Thanks so much, Charles. Bye-bye.